Hi, everybody. It's Deirdre Fay, and I'm here with Graham Music, and I have been reading his latest book, Nurturing Children. And I got to tell you, I am entranced with it. I'm reading it and learning, and he, I mean, Graham is an amazing storyteller, but then how he weaves the theory in that is just really opens my mind and my heart at the same time. So I have a ton of things that I want to go through with him, and I encourage you to pick up his book, but more importantly, to read it and learn yourself and grow. Now, Graham talks a lot about working with children, but what I found reading it, it is so applicable to my own development, to the people I work with. It's like, these are the basic building blocks and we can all learn and grow from that. So anyway, Graham, I'm just talking up a storm. Anything you want to say before we start? No, other than I, I do, I'm, a, I'm an adult psychotherapist and a child psychotherapist, and I do know that none of my work with adults could really be the same without really an understanding of children and working with them as well. So the two have this wonderful synergy for me. I should add, just so people know, that you have written a number of books, but you're also a clinician at the Tavistock Clinic, which is the big uh, attachment-focused clinic in the UK and around the world. It does a lot of training, right? Grammy, yeah, yeah. Want to say about that? Center. yeah, it's a national center for training. It is the place where Bob reinvented attachment theory, although he wasn't always that popular on his own corridors. And it's a center for psychoanalytic psychotherapy and other forms of psychotherapy. And particularly those influenced by, well, I'm particularly influenced by attachment theory and neurobiology and trying to link those with psychoanalytic and systemic thinking. Right. You do that really well. So can I just pop in and just go right through and ask you the questions? Yeah, that would be great. So I was reading from reading about Michael, one of the clients that you worked with. And you talked about Neville Symington's, is that his name? Am I saying his name right? Yeah, or Symington, yeah. Symington. And he called it life-giving. A part of the self does not, that does not turn away from life or refuse hope. Yeah. And he said that Symington maintains a central place for hope. He wrote, turning away from the life-giver is turning against the self. Yeah. I thought that was so powerful. And later on, you talk about how important it is for us as therapists, for any of us in our own development, to be staying in a place of hope. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about that to start us off. Okay. Well, I think one thing is that it's really important that we're not naive in this, that, um, that there's false hope, there's hope that is built on hopelessness and it doesn't feel very real and genuine and true. And what we want to trigger in the personality is the part of the self that can genuinely find some, some hope. So it's not a manic defense. It's not a denial of excruciating, bad, painful, difficult feelings. It's, a, it's, it's finding a place of genuine hope from which we can grow. And so the opposite of that is many of the clients, patients that we work with who have almost like an addiction to sort of semi-death-like experiences in a way who can hate life, who can refuse hope. And one of the things we know from many of our clients and probably from, from most of us in ourselves is that actually it can be quite frightening to dare to hope. Right. In some ways it's easier to be hopeless, to be pessimistic. We have a natural negativity bias as we know as a species. And so to take the courage to hope is much more difficult often than to take what for many of us is an easy path of pessimism, hopelessness, expecting the worst, not really trusting that life can give us the riches that, you know, that, we, that actually we know as therapists people can have. I love that you bring that up and that's woven through your whole book and it, it makes it such a resilient read that there is hope and that people can grow and develop. So um, Thank you. you talked about how um, another client that you talked about was Samantha. And you said Samantha had little belief that bad situations could be recovered from. Yet yeah. it is exactly such a belief that mismatches and ruptures could be recovered from that bodes well for emotional health and is seen in successful psychotherapy. Yeah, now I have to confess, I cannot remember who I meant by Samantha because I changed all the names. I might need right, to 
go into some of those details. But what I absolutely know is that emotional resilience um, doesn't develop from everything coming right and everything being going easy in life, that it only comes from finding a way of repairing things that have gone a bit wrong. Hmm. And But of course, if they go too wrong, then also you don't have a chance to develop resilience because we give up hope. And so many of the kids that are most worrying to us often give up very, very early on. So they'll try something, maybe try something in school and they will give up and retreat or they'll kick off or fly off the handle or they'll just withdraw. And so having the faith that when things go a bit wrong, they'll come right again is what we see in secure attachment, I think. Ed Tronic and Beatrice Beebe and people like that have long taught us this. And it, it's that which gives rise to resilience. It, it's this idea that we can all, it, that it's worth trying and trying again because it might come right in the second or third occasion. So in some ways it's very basic theory, very, very basic idea, but actually you have to know it in our bones to really help those things come alive. It's so true there. And you talked then about you, you were lucky enough to be and maybe continue to be with Anne Alvarez. And uh, you talked about how she used the word reclaiming from life. Yes. Well, reclaiming towards life. In fact, it's a similar idea to, to Simmington's in some ways. So she talks about working. So in traditional psychoanalytic thinking and work, often we spent too much time concentrating on just the negative on the difficulty, on the pain, on the upset, on the awfulness that people are experiencing. And I don't think for a moment that we should ever shirk that. But what she found was there are a group of clients, patients, and she worked primarily with autistic kids, but I think it's true of nearly everyone we work with to an extent, that had given up, were dulled down, were a bit shut down. They're not in dissociated shutdown states, but more flat, depressed type of shutdown states, or parts of themselves had never quite developed so she talks about reclamation and, and reclaiming but actually we might think about kids who are what she called undrawn in fact rather than withdrawn they've never really been alive and so she has this idea of becoming live company for people and bringing them back into life from a, a slightly more dead cut off shut down place and I, I think that's quite a complex challenge therapeutically because again it's the sort of thing that's easy to do in a slightly naive slightly manic way but to genuinely find, be able to reach people in their depths of difficulties and despair or shutdownness, but then find a way of helping them come out into the, into the light, as it were, into hope and into, into liveliness. That's where the challenge often is. You give some beautiful examples of that as you were working with people in your book. Um, you also talked about... Um, Carla Lyons Ruth's idea of stress inoculation and exposure yeah. to manageable difficulties can form a stress inoculation. How would, Graham, what do you think? Where does it become stress inoculation? Where do we actually grow from it? And where is it that we just stay in that shutdown place? Is it because somebody never reached in and helped I, awaken I think our so. minds? I think so. I think um, so. A metaphor I use in the book, and I've, it's been very central to me, and it's a very simple one, is that often we can think of our clients or patients as in, a, as, a, as in a ditch, in a dark place, and that if we just join them in that dark place, there's two of us stuck there, and that we can never then find a way out. If we're too far away on the outside, waving down from, as in the caricature of the classic psychonetic um, blank screen, then also we're not much help and so what we need to do is reach one foot in to the ditch and have one foot firmly on the bank reach a hand in very firmly to reach out to theirs but also make sure that we've got a place inside ourselves outside of what they're experiencing and then we can find a way of helping to pull them out and that will be different for every single person we work with the, the way we position ourselves the extent to which we get in or stay on the outside those will all shift and change but what I absolutely know is that by being able to, by somebody knowing that we can stay with them in their difficulty and trusting us, eventually they'll learn to trust that they can come out and take risks as well. And so 
I'm not sure which it, which one was Samantha, um, but I can remember, for example, a three or four year old that I work with who I mentioned in the book who would just shut down and cut off at something would go wrong and it would feel like absolutely feel like the end of the world. And she would shut down, cut, um, cut off. She, or she might cry for literally the whole session or even several sessions. And by the end of the therapy, she was full of hope, excitement, joy, and possibility. And this was symbolized, I think in one session where she, um, where she was playing with some toys on, a, on the edge of a sofa and, the, and the, the, one of the toys fell behind the couch. And in the past, this would have precipitated a terrible collapse and my heart was in my mouth and I was thinking, this is gonna be really awful. And what she did was, instead of collapsing like she once would have done, she got this piece of string and she called down to the toy that was behind the couch, you okay down there? And she made me, hold one end of the string, which I think was important symbolically, and she went and tied up the, 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 the toy that was, it was a little doll, the, that was behind the sofa, and we had to pull it up together. So in a way, we were pulling out, and it was in a way a representative of her psyche, we're pulling out an aspect of her from the dark depths to the light, if you like. I do remember you you wrote that in the book, and it's a really lovely articulation of it. The other thing that you just mentioned in that is the mind-mindedness, like it, it going into the ditch, but also being able to be outside of the ditch enough that you can be with somebody. So there's that witness consciousness or the mentalization or mind-mindedness that, that happens that's so important in the, in the process as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think, well, I think that's true of, of all good therapeutic work. And I think most schools of therapeutic, most schools of therapy have a similar kind of concept. Obviously, it's central as well to mindfulness. This idea that there's not just, that there's a part of the mind that's watching what, uh, what's going on, but not in a kind of detached place, but it, there's an overarching awareness of what's, of, of what's going on. So we can metabolize and process experience without just being inside it. And you show that so beautifully in the book about these kids who learned how to have their own mind. How to so have... There was a slightly lost the video there, sorry. Yeah, oh. well, you talked about how in your book the, you followed these children and shared and described how they developed having their own mind by you being able to reflect their mind. Yeah, and often I think a very helpful thing to do with kids and with adults actually, is not just to talk about what they're doing or make interpretations, but actually to point out the fact that, um, oh, it looks like Sally now has a mind that can really think, think big important thoughts, that those kinds of statements will allow them to get interested in their own mental processes in a way that probably a lot of these kids have never had the experience of before. Yes, I loved that. I loved watching that. Um, you talked about the protective optimism uh, that's not a defensive denying of painful realities, but it's helpful for young children needing to learn, experiment, and persist at tasks that initially feel too difficult. Yeah, well again, this is going back a bit to the rupture repair type of idea, but it's the idea that actually, so a client needs to know really that their despair is being taken seriously, that they're upset, that their depression, that their anxiety, that their fear, all the negative emotions are being taken very seriously. So you need me to know and really deeply know that you're feeling those things. But you also need to know that I'm, I don't trust that that's all there is to experience and to feel, that there's something outside of that as well. And so just saying, oh no, it's all gonna be fine, never helps anybody. But just staying with the despair also doesn't help anybody. And so the protective optimism, I think, comes from being able to reach into the despair and difficulty at the same time as knowing there's a place outside it. And I think a client knows when we know that deeply inside ourselves. That helps them have that bridge to come yeah. out of the ditch and climb out with us. Yeah, right? exactly. Exactly. So yeah. it really means that we have to be doing our own work to stay uh, balanced and solid inside ourselves and not get overwhelmed by the amount of despair and hopelessness that so many people have. Absolutely. That's always the work, isn't it? And isn't our work, so much of our work is in our own cancer transference in trying to work out what we're thinking, what we're feeling, how being in the presence of a particular person is triggering a particular 
kind of emotional and embodied and psychological state inside us and then trying to work out the meaning of that so I found that particularly to be the case with for example very neglected shutdown kids that I've worked with in adults many of whom make us I don't say they make us feel but in whose presence we feel equally shut down dead so the kind of clients who often I've talked often we talk about as having experienced severe early neglect and in their presence we they might be the ones with whom we might actually not really be concentrating very hard or we might be nodding but really making shopping lists or thinking about what you're going to make for dinner and never admitting that to anybody but in reality our experience of numbness and shutdownness is in fact the biggest communication because our body is resonating and our minds are resonating with a kind of lack of mental aliveness inside them so if we then can then work with that what it what does it actually feel like to feel so numbed and shut down then we can help them know it in themselves in such a way that they don't have to just be in it as it were so we have to find a way into it and then out of it in such a way that we can help them and it's always in our own counter transference that that really happens and that's uh dan stern's intersubjective matrix we're picking up what's going on right there in the moment Absolutely. It's the intersubjective matrix, the embodied countertransference, all kinds of different ways of describing it. Mm. But we're such resonant species that we, you know, we, we're all the time picking things up from the other. And I think in psychoanalysis, psychotherapy, often what we're trying to do is work out, well, I'm picking something up and experiencing something. Am I experiencing an aspect of the client's current state? Or am I, for example, acting and feeling something rather like their parent might have done? So you, we might find that with some clients we end up, I don't know, or we find ourselves acting a little bit more assertively or aggressively or punitively than we might with other clients. And that might well be because in a way they've evoked in us an aspect of their earlier experience, which might not be very helpful. And then we're, then we're in the process of acting out. And so that's, again, why we need to be so self-aware in order to do this work. Mm. So that we step out of those, that kind of enactment and help give them a new experience. Yeah, incredible to have you be so clear about it. Um, you talk about Francis Tustin's view that some mainly autistic children fear they might liquefy without rituals that confer a feeling of solidity. And I, I thought that was such an interesting idea. You said you thought initially that that a steward you called uh, a client you call steward was defensively refusing to think about anything difficult. However, rather than not wanting to think, he lacked the foundations of a mind that could manage thoughts. Yeah. So in a way, it, some of this is linked with Beyond's ideas of thoughts without a thinker, but also the fact that actually he had very little to hold himself together. And this again is going back to Winnicott in a way, who talked about the fear of falling forever and desperate attempt to hold yourself together and to brace against that possibility to refuse it. Tusky, Tustin's metaphor of liquefaction, I think, is really, really helpful. The almost idea is that we don't exist unless, and so autistic kids will use all kinds of rituals. They'll hold on to hard objects. They will perseverate. They'll do all kinds of strange things. But we all have things that we do it, which are less extreme and to ward off less extreme fears and feelings but in a way they're of the same order and some of those might be physiological things like touching things or rubbing yourself self-soothing and some of them might be holding on to things some of them might be muscular tension and some of them might be overusing sort of mental capacities because you develop a mind that's over active as a way of compensating for not having an external object to rely on we, we then rely on our minds instead of for example um, a good parent so these are all ways in a way of holding yourself together and in extreme variants, particularly in these kind of kids who are so porous and thin skinned, like many kids on the spectrum are, it's literally, it literally feels to them that they might, they might liquefy unless they use these rituals. And that, would that be also a similar state of, as we develop a self, even when somebody's not on the spectrum, they're developing a self, but that, liquefied state feels like an autistic state to people that they don't have a, enough of a self there to pull yeah. themselves together i think that's right and i think one of the things we're trying to develop in psychotherapy is, is and one of the 
So it's interesting if we think about it in relation also to some of the kind of Eastern practices, mindfulness, meditation, even yoga, is that what we want is people to have a sufficiently solid sense of self for them to be able to let it go, if you like. So one of the um, problems with going into areas like mindfulness and meditation too quickly before there's enough sense of self is that it's used in, its, in itself as a form of false holding, holding of yourself together. Um, so it becomes a kind of spiritual bypass as opposed to, and that's the same with full selves in a way. Winnicott would say the full self is always there to protect the true self, which hasn't, might, which maybe hasn't formed yet. And so with the, with, so with the client that you mentioned before, hi, called Stuart, he literally didn't seem to have a mind of his own to think thoughts yet. And so for example, he'd be watching the television and it would be as if he was in the television program. So he'd be moving around. There was nothing to separate him from the characters and their actions on the screen, as it were. Would you say, Graham, this may be a stretch, but when with a preoccupied stance, people who are more prone to being preoccupied, that they're more over there in that other person, would that be a similar experience? Yeah, well, it's maybe it arises for a slightly different reason, but there are similarities. So I'm going to make sure I feel safe. Now, the only way I can feel safe with you, because you're so chaotic and unpredictable, is to really be ultra watchful and vigilant of what you might be thinking and feeling, what you might do next. So that's what will make me feel safe. So I regulate myself by ensuring that you're, regu you're regulated and I might even have to do the regulating of you, but I'm incredibly watchful. So that would be what we would see in a, a more ambivalent attachment style. And in that process, one tends to lose sight of oneself. So it's much more important that I regulate you than, than I'm able to be aware of myself. All right. Uh, let's see, there are so many things. Oh gosh, I had highlighted this all and now I can't find everything that I had. <laughs> this was another piece and I don't know who the client was here that you were talking about. You said, um, a few weeks later during a football game, this client, whoever it was, turned the light on. As it flickered, I noticed a glimmer of interest in him and asked what he noticed. He said, the color. I said, isn't that amazing? The room seems to change color when you turn the light on. So this articulates what you were talking about, right? He did it again and looked at me saying, go sort of pink. I said, yes, the whole room seems to change. And what is so, in, so interesting is that you noticed it, Damien. Mm. You have a mind now that can notice things like that. Yeah, yeah. This was the nearest he had been to a genuine open-eyed interest to aesthetic appreciation. Yeah. He, lo he looked pleased, did it again, and said it makes a sound. And you marked it again saying, wow, yes, you've noticed the sound it makes when you turn the light on. Ah, uh, yeah. That, so that was... many beautiful stories like that in here. Uh... Thank you, dear. It was, a, it was a very, very exciting moment. And so again, this was a kid who was sort of, he's, he, he managed to get by in life by rushing around, by being very ritualistic, by, and he was very traumatized, this boy. And so having the, finding the space inside himself to notice something like how the room changes color but when you turn the light on or that there's a sound was what Meltzer and Sue Reed as well, um, who was at the Tavistock, called aesthetic, a, a moment of aesthetic appreciation, appreciation of the potential beauty of life. And so many of these traumatized kids don't have those moments and they have them so rarely. So when they do come through, it's easy for us to miss them. So I think we really have to hold them, frame them, amplify them, and let, let the clients or patients know that we know that they're having such an experience. Mm. And you do that beautifully. And the, in the body-oriented world, we would have them like feel what that's like in the yeah. always to just, just continue to drink that in over and over. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now the other thing I wanted to ask uh, about uh, was epistemic. I can never say that word. Epistemic trust. Fonagy's. Yeah. Fine. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I mean, it's a slightly um, 
highfalutin concept, which probably isn't as complex as all that. So I think so epistemic trust in effect means that I trust, if you're my parent, and normally what you've delivered or what you've said or what you've thought or what you've done is trustworthy, then I will learn to develop what Vonnegut calls epistemic trust. In other words, if you say that Y equals Z or that um, it's safe to cross the road or that he's a nice person, I will learn to trust that. It's a kind of exaggerated variant of social referencing. Whereas if kids who have always been mistreated who who haven't been able to depend on adults because they haven't been safe, they won't develop epistemic trust. They'll develop epistemic vigilance. So they will be untrusting. And those are the kids who teachers really struggle with because they don't take in what the teachers are saying. They don't trust the teachers are trustworthy. And that's very painful if you don't understand these processes for a teacher or another professional or another adult because the teacher feels that they're a decent human being who wants the best for the child. And the child is saying, no, you're completely untrustworthy. I'm not going to, I'm not going to take in a word you say, I'll throw it right back in your face because it, it's just not safe. So those dynamics are really important to tease out. And actually I find it a particularly useful concept when I'm working with other professionals and trying to help them understand the kids that they're struggling with. In what way? How, how Graham? Well, because if, a, if a teacher or say if we use the example of a teacher, if a teacher tries to, is trying to teach a child who throws it back in their face, then they will feel the child is misbehaving or ungrateful or they will feel bad as a teacher and they'll feel I'm useless at this or all those kind of, any kind of thoughts of either blaming self or other blame might, might kick in, but it will stop the learning process. If the teacher can understand the dynamic, ah, it's not how I'm saying it, what I'm saying, it's the fact that he doesn't, understand, he doesn't trust adults Hmm. And so if I can then help him know that I understand that he doesn't trust me and then use that as a starting point, then that can make a difference. And it really can make a difference. So again, it's making those small little building blocks that uh, uh, Carlin Lines really talks about the, the building blocks, you know, the scaffolding yeah. to move somebody forward to actually build them. And you said something else that I thought was so powerful. You used the client Stuart, but you said children like Stuart often need to refine good feelings and memories before confronting difficult ones. And um, I lost the last sentence. They really need to find good feelings. Good feelings and memories before confronting difficult ones. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know this more than anyone really from working with trauma and what you were saying before about working with body states, positive body states, and that we've made so many mistakes. I particularly made so many mistakes over the years in my early days when I was told you just got to go for the pain, the difficulty, the trauma. And often that just re-triggers the trauma, but not only, even if it didn't re-trigger the trauma, the other problem with that is that you can't process difficult experiences until you know there's something better as well. So you have to, as you say, in a nuanced, subtle way, build the experience of trust. So um, so to start with, so there's one example in the, in the book of a, of a young girl who was placed with an aunt having been sexually abused at home. And in the, my early days, I'd have felt I'm only earning my money if I make sure that, that we make space for her to talk about the sexual abuse that she experienced. And what I'd realized, it took me years to realize that what actually I needed to do with kids like that is to help them really trust that they're having a good experience, that, they're, that, for example, her aunt loved her, cared for her, had her best interests at heart, and then ask exactly what that felt like, the sort of things you were saying before. So what does it feel like when you look at your aunt and you can see love in her eyes? Oh, it feels, I feel all gooey inside, or my breathing goes deep, or those sorts of things. And those are the things you build and grow and develop and solidify. And then from there, they have the confidence to know life is good enough that I can then go and face some of the difficulty that I experienced. Mm -hmm. It always reminds me of John Gottman, the couples researcher, when he talks yeah. about the five to one ratio. You need five good things in order to deal with the one crummy thing. Yeah, that's and good. Example. It's so true for all of us in all kinds of situations. Uh, well, I know we don't have a lot of time, but I have like so many notes here for thousands of things that you I'd say that, that is the best right. compliment because i think if we can get if we can generate curiosity and interest and care and then you know that's the best thing really
right thing we do well and when people just to read the book it's a it's almost like a little novel it's like a storytelling it's a about the theory so it's putting it right into place it's quite fabulous so thank you grandma i encourage everybody to get a copy of the book and read it oh, thank you Deirdre. really really appreciate it total my total pleasure graham